Hello everyone, welcome back to episode 15 of Night Call, and today we are going to start with our new clues. Yeah, my neighbor flushes the toilet, I don't care. <laughs> so, what do we have here? So, yesterday Jonas was eliminated as one of our suspects. So, okay, so who's heard in your taxi the fish symbol is linked to a cult yeah but what i'm wondering is why is the fish symbol that was drawn on the wall with blood only her thing if she is in the same cult as apollonie why isn't the fish symbol also something that could be linked to her oh but the fish is also the original symbol for christianity Hmm. Messages on the crime scenes really point to, to Gilda again. Oh wait, what's that? Victim 3? Witness heard female voices. So that's like... Yeah, I again, I think I don't... I, I, again, I don't think that Evie did it. Um, okay, victim 3 was... Oh wait, victim 3 was also part of the cult? Why, again, is this still only her? She is part of it too. <clears throat> Would cult members really kill one of their own? So victim number two and three, Apollonie knew them. Because they were all three? No, victim number one and two knew them. Well, also doesn't make sense. If Apollonie claims that she's a vampire, why had victim number two garlic in her hand again, which doesn't make any sense because I thought victim number two was a guy. I'm so confused and I don't even know where to get new info or I don't know. I can't seem to visit this point of interest as one point. I don't know why, if it's a bug or if it's not meant to be visited because maybe it's connected to Jonas, which wouldn't help us much. I don't know, it could also be like Gilda who sets the Moonflesh cult up because she hates the cult. I don't know. What really intrigues me are the messages on the on on the wall. Message on crime scene number one is only one god. We don't know a lot about victim number one, except for he was a firefighter, wasn't he? Because it would have made sense if victim if if the victim was part of the Moonflesh cult and then Gilda killed him and wrote only one god because I don't know. I don't know anymore. I don't know about cults. We have nothing to look at, do we? No. I think it really sucks. It, it really seems to be necessary to pick up the whistleblower. Because... We did get new information from him twice, I think. So I don't remember. Did I see him? I don't know. I'm confused. I'm confused, but I think I'm going to rule out Evie. I'm gonna rule out RV and I think it's really mean that he's always a suspect. Just because he's homeless. Angelique de Fondomiere. She looks like a fancy lady. The next passenger getting in your cab enters in a cloud of extremely heavy perfume. Oh yeah, she looks that way. Oh no! A fox. It's a well-known scent, one of you, one you often see advertised on the Champs Elysees. A woman must be in her fifties. She has impeccable posture. The fur she wears around her neck must be worth several days' pay. She opens her mouth. Good evening. Before you start driving, I just need to tell you something very. She purses her lips, attempting to stifle the word that is about to come out, and raises a finger. Shit. Whore. She continues to look at you, the same smile froze on her face. She's just shouted gibberish at you, but her face hasn't budged. It's like she isn't even aware of what she said. She purses her lips even harder. I... doggy foreskin. She shakes her head. I am truly sorry. I... please, hear me out. You are so taken aback that you find nothing to say. 
I am suffering from major emotional trauma. It seems to have triggered very strong verbal episodes. They're exhausting, to be honest. I hope you can shit understand. Please know that I don't believe a single word that I'm saying. She smiles. Tiny dick. It's my husband. She shrugs. Married for 25 years, two kids, a house on the coast, all sorts of fun plans for the future, then... A sad smile flashes across her face. Eat shit. She looks at you. He certainly did a job on you. My husband is a very Nazi rock muncher, unique person. But indeed, I'm sorry to say it now, he really hurt me. She grins for just a second. Here I am discovering how to live alone for the first time at 50. Crazy, isn't it? Toilet brush up your ass. It's really not easy. You bite your cheek to avoid laughing and start driving. With a bit of luck, your passenger won't say anything for the remainder of the ride. Your passenger heaves an odd sigh. He didn't even take me home. She's talking to herself and her voice is steeped in sorrow. I wasn't asking for much. A little tenderness. Rotten phallus. He's my spouse, after all. My husband. Married for 25 years. 25 years. Everything alright? Well, I guess suppose it's not. Let's just ask her. She lifts her head abruptly. Beg your pardon? She lowers her eyes. I was talking to myself. Look where I'm shit. Please forgive me. Is everything alright? I don't know. I don't know anything anymore. He leaves me. He ignores me. Asshole. He sends me a bouquet of roses for my birthday and invites me to dinner. Then leaves as soon as the bill is paid. She freezes. She stays that way for a few seconds without moving or breathing. You okay? She suddenly heaves a deeply sorrowful sigh. Not from the heart, but from her gut, her bowels. You jerk off. You're young. You raise your gaze to look at your passenger. Perhaps you don't realize what it does to you. Actually, no one seems to understand. She's shaking. Shit! It's all ending. Everything is broken. It's all a waste. She stares at you. You can see the shame in her face. Her cheeks turn crimson. Her eyes fill with tears. Please forgive me. I ask you, bitch, to please, whore. Forgive me, bastard. Uh, I'm just gonna say nothing. I don't know a lot, but I don't know if... Tourette is something that you get from trauma? Eh, I'm just gonna say nothing. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't believe it. She stops herself, realizes something. I don't believe it. Your passenger's voice seems even more distant than before. What if I actually did mean what I was saying? I don't know what's going on in my mind anymore. At first I thought it was dementia, that I was becoming senile. She catches her breath, as for you, you approach her destination. I think it's called Tourette Syndrome. I, I just left dinner with my husband. He was distant and cold, even though he was the one who insisted we see each other. He even chose the restaurant, La Pierre, a very, very nice place. Oh, that, that, ooh, that's where our cook works. She shakes her head. Tell me about the cook, please. I still don't really know what he wanted. He ate almost nothing, didn't drink a drop of wine. It was dismal. Then he got up and left me there alone like a fucking idiot. She smiles. A fucking idiot. That's what I am. Oh, one hell of a fucking idiot. She sighs with relief. Excuse me, but I, I think that did me some good. Your wide eyes make her laugh. Sorry, I got carried away. Tell me about the cook in the restaurant, please. It was... You look for the right term. Uh, surprising. <laughs> she giggles. 
It was the first and the last time, cross my heart. Silence. The last time. You parked the taxi in front of her place. Please tell me about the restaurant. Tell me about the cook. Your passenger stares intently at your building for a few seconds, like it looks ready to step off its foundation to run down the street. I think it's past. I feel so much better. I feel relieved. Like... She smiles. Like a dick sucker. Her face flushes. She all but throws her fare in your face and seconds she slams the door and runs towards the lobby of her building. Once she's inside, you drive away. What kind of aura do we have? But, I don't know. People just feel free to insult, to throw insults in our taxi around <laughs> Stacy Fit. Well, at least she tipped us well. I think I need a gas station soon. Is that our whistleblower? I don't know. I need a gas station really soon. I think that's our whistleblower, isn't it? Let's go there. If it's not him, then I'll drive to the gas station. No, that's the pastor. Ah! Could he know Gilda, perhaps? You know, let's just... Oh, let's just take him. It's a short ride, and then we go to the gas station. The next passenger getting in your cab has a surprisingly calming presence. He gently closes his door and gives you an address on the other side of the city. You start driving. That's not true. It's street down and then left. You send your passenger wants to talk about the killer. Yes, talk about him. Rather chilly out, isn't it? His voice is warm and deep. Finally, you notice his light collar. You're not too cold? Um, we do what we can to stay warm. You've got a lot of grit to want to drive in this kind of weather. The holy waterfront froze yesterday. We had to pour boiling water over to break the ice. Oh, we know that. That's the same conversation. Okay, I'm gonna go to the gas station now. Nothing new in our talk with the pastor guy. Now I can go to the gas station and read. Oh, not read, but talk to the guy. I was wondering maybe if we buy a newspaper, we get a new clue? I think I'm gonna try it now. We're good enough on money, so I think we can afford a newspaper. So we're gonna talk to the murder. <laughs> not gonna talk to the murderer. Ah, oh, what's wrong with me? We're gonna talk to the clerk. Blah blah, nice one. Then we're buying a newspaper. And then we're leaving. So I'm just gonna take a look who we can drive now. Wait, I know that's Gilda. Oh, I was wondering why her face seems so familiar and it's Gilda. Okay, let's drive her. <laughs> I need to get to Notre Dame ASAP. You got it. Your next passenger slips into the cab and closes the door with incredible care. Good evening, sir. She's one of the suspects and her voice rings like a chime, high-pitched, discreet, ethereal. Notre Dame de Paris, please. As you pull away, you glance at the time, not exactly time for a prayer. You drive in silence for a few minutes, glancing at your passenger. She seems so fragile. You can't imagine her in the act of... My friend and I were wondering if you knew where the secret entrance to the catacombs is. Her question pulls you out of your thoughts. A secret entrance? <laughs> yeah, you know, the catacombs. There's the main entrance, and there are the hidden ones. 
They're not open to the public, of course, but that's what makes it fun. The way she said fun made her sound about seven years old. Could she be a murderer? We'd love to visit them on our own. You shake your head. Unfortunately, you've never heard a thing about a secret entrance. I don't know. Sorry. She seems disappointed. I thought a taxi driver would surely know Paris really well. Uh, yes, but not the catacombs. You attempt to smile. She doesn't react. You've never been? You shake your head again. It's so cool down there in summer. I go often through the main entrance. A break and then... Uh, no, he doesn't know. I thought so too, but... Did you say something? Is she on the phone? Uh, wait. I, I was talking to my friend. Your friend? Uh, of course. Jesus. Oh, oh no. Maniac. You take a second to digest the information. Jesus Christ? <laughs> sure. Who else? But you talk about him to everyone? Well, yeah. Why shouldn't I? People don't think you're... She cuts you off and becomes defensive. Crazy? A liar? She shrugs her shoulders and her face remains expressionless. I don't care. Even if everyone else turns their back on me, I have Jesus. Even when I'm alone, I have Jesus. She glances outside. You keep as much of an eye on her as you can in the rearview mirror. I work at the Garnier Opera House. I'm far from the most eccentric one there. So Jesus and I are fine. People leave us alone. She lets her face relax, smiles. What about you? Anybody speak to you? Uh, I don't think so. I'm really lucky. I have Jesus Christ by my side. But what does he say to you? He's always by my side. She pauses as if realizing she hadn't been quite clear enough, not precise enough. Like she could tell you didn't get it. He talks to me about people we see. He tells me who's good and who is bad. Oh, 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 oh no, she's it. She, she's the murderer, I know it. <laughs> no, I don't know. He, really, he, she, she, she's imagining talking to someone. He tells her who's good and is bad. If he just tells her that these people from the cult are bad, and the, oh, I think I got my prime suspect now. Your blood curdles. Uh-huh. He tells me who I should avoid and who I should talk to. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> What's he think of me? Of you? It's funny you should ask that. Well, no, not really, because you stabbed me. Her voice becomes softer. You can see Notre Dame, you're almost there. I'm sure I've already met you. Yeah, you slammed a fucking knife into my ribs. Ah! I don't know why, but you and I, us too? We've run into each other somewhere before. Yeah, you creepy lady. You tried to kill me. You shake your head no. Do you ever go to the opera? No again. Then maybe I've been in your taxi before? No, I think you waited outside of my taxi. Strange. Her last words ring around in a cab. It seems heavy and stiffly. Oh my god, she's the murderer. What? Huh? Why, yes, it's true. <laughs> Jesus is right. <laughs> We're here. Jesus is right. I stabbed you. Oh, I remember now. You park. You can feel sweat running down your back. She giggles. I hope to see you again in the city of God. Oh, my... Uh, no, thanks. She drops money onto the front seat. More than enough for her fare. You raise your head. The door slams. Your passenger is already outside. Call her? You lower your window. Miss? Her figure doesn't turn around and she keeps walking toward the cathedral. Miss? Uh, why would I run after her? Do I want to get killed? Or do I run after her to give her money back? I don't know. Uh, no, I'm not gonna go after her. She's crazy. She's scary and I think she tried to murder me too. She tried to murder me, I think. Now. I'm pretty sure of it. Oh hey, that's Carlo again. I want to see what, what his next thing is.
No, it's not. Oh, he looks so much alike. That's the womanizer guy. I don't want, no, I don't want to do that. Okay, no, I think I'm gonna go, I'm gonna give the newspaper a try now. Pull a newspaper out of your glove compartment and start leaving through it, eventually something grabs your eye. It's just a few lines, a funny anecdote, a man disguised as Santa Claus had to be taken off the roof of a building by firemen. <gasps> Aw, Santa. He didn't find his sleigh after all. He was highly inebriated and stated he did not know how he had gotten there. Ah, uh, that sounds like Santa. You turn the page and stop. You've read about a third of the newspaper. Uh, I'm gonna keep reading. You stop reading and go back a few pages. You thought you saw something. It's a rather enthusiastic article about a bar named Napo. You make note of the information with interest in your line of work. That kind of thing can always come in handy. You only have a third left to read. Um, read the whole thing. As soon as you get to the page, you stop. Your instinct tells you to look at. It's a short article mentioning the strike led by a handful of employees of Confiseries du Marais, a luxury candy brand. These employees demand better wages. The owners, the group Diamant, are threatening to relocate their factories abroad. You shut the paper, it'll end up in the trash tonight. If you remember, it's there. Otherwise, it will spend the rest of its days in your glove compartment. I'm disappointed. Oh, wait, that's, uh, that's, that's... Jonas, that's our, um, that was our one suspect who had an alibi. Yes. Although maybe I shouldn't make any assumptions anymore on who's who based on the pictures because I have guessed wrong so many times this today. Yeah, okay. I'll just, I'm just, I'm interested in listening to him. The passenger getting in your cab barely says hello. Oh, how nice. He mumbles an address and buries his head in his laptop. He taps away, not saying a word as you start driving. You've seen passengers like him before, introverts, silent types, people so absorbed in what they're doing that they don't even notice you. The road flies by. The sound of the passenger's fingers on the keyboard reminds you of the sound of rain hitting the hood of your car. Mm, having a good evening? Please don't kill me. He grumbles a laconic reply. He dives back into his computer screen. Okay, I'm not gonna talk to you. You keep an eye on him. His fingers are flying. You get the impression he's not typing full sentences. The rhythm is too short. Halting. Are you writing a novel? Or are you a programmer? Well, let's just ask him. He lifts his head and looks at you with interest. Um, in the manner of speaking, how did you know? Uh, from the way you were typing. He pauses and flashes a tiny smile. Very perceptive. He stares back at his computer and types a few lines on the keyboard. He lifts his head all of a sudden. What do you think of the world? He holds his hands up. Uh, sorry, that question came out of nowhere. How do you perceive the world? Did someone create it? A god? Many gods? An alien being? He remains silent for a moment. I don't know what the truth in our eyes is, so I'm just gonna tell the truth. I used to believe, but I don't anymore. In God? Yeah, we. Oui. Allah? Get offended. Uh, tell the truth. Allah. The passenger nods. But not anymore. Just, just tell the truth. Nope, no more. I understand. Things have been rough for believers lately. I stopped believing long before. He smiles. You hesitate and say... Just not interested. He smiles at you. I get it. I feel the same way. Personally, I believe that all of this, he indicates the world around him, is of absolutely no importance. The world doesn't exist. The earth, the moon, the sun, how you felt when you got out of bed this morning, none of that exists. He pauses dramatically, no way to know whether or not it was on purpose. Um, let him keep talking. I want to know more about his theory. He clicks his tongue and stares at you. You feel uncomfortable. <laughs> All of this is a simulation. I sincerely believe that. A computer simulation? He flashes a crooked smile. Exactly. 
We're more of a scientific experiment, a cryptocurrency mining operation. Or maybe even an accident. No more, no less. He pauses and looks at you. How does it feel to learn that the world doesn't exist? That our god is nothing more than a computer program? It's interesting. He raises his voice slightly and seems excited. All right, it's a theory. He smirks. And we'll probably never really know the... That's why I'm working on this project. He glances at his computer. I'm trying to figure out whether or not we really are in a simulation. We live, we eat, we sleep, we love. But if we deliberately try to put an end to the simulation, we might disappear. He stares intently at you. We are. He snaps his fingers. We are no longer. He seems to love that part of his speech. He's relishing in it. How can I prove it? Well, first I have to find a flaw in the system. A flaw? Yes, if we are a simulation, we were programmed. And the ones who programmed us either made mistakes or tried to save money. <laughs> Let him keep talking. So we just have to find the float value, the weak spot, so we can break it. We've got to crash the simulation and die in order to understand our own reality. It's a terrible fate, isn't it? Die to exist. Die to become real. Die to make our existence materialize. He pauses, smiles, stares. How does it feel to learn all that? Are you angry? Are you disappointed? Sad? Defeated? Ready to commit suicide? Are you trying to recruit me as a test subject? I go through all of those phases every day. Oh, that's sad. He sighs. I tell myself the world isn't ready yet. And yet it's our future to discover our reality. He chuckles. You park your taxi in front of the address he gave you. He looks deeply into your eyes. So, how do you feel? <laughs> You're crazy. I feel scared. I don't know. Excellent answer. <laughs> Yay, he likes me. Glad he's not the killer, and I know it. <laughs> A scientist's cardinal rule. Always doubt, always question, and always verify. One day, if an atheist states that Allah doesn't exist, that he knows this because there is no scientific proof of his existence, you will know that he does not have a true scientific mind. He looks up at his building, talking and talking and didn't even notice we'd arrived. I thank you kindly for this talk. It's always been interesting to bounce ideas off one another to put them to the test. After all, we're waiting to wage war with the person or entity that made us. He pays his fare and gets out. He disappears quickly into his building, his laptop under one arm. <gasps> you know what also just dawned on me? The killer it calls itself, or I don't know if it calls itself that, or if it's just been named that way, Angel of Death, Angel Catholic Church, maybe? Oh, that's our Yakuza guy. I want to talk to her, though. Do we know her or not? Oh, oh, do we remember now? You've just been hit with a migraine. You crack your window, I see Parisian air fills the cab. You need to rest. You need coffee. You need to close your eyes. Just a minute. One tiny minute. You don't need to sleep. Yes, it's us! You raise your head and see yourself sitting in a back seat. Your guts clenches. No, it's more like someone is pulling your guts out. Yeah, I look like shit, I know. Okay, okay. No surprise considering all the crap I eat, right? It won't take too long. You'll be able to get back to defending the weak and the poor right after. And maybe cleaning up your reputation and that pretty face of yours. You're not gonna get the job done. You close your eyes, hoping this mirage will vanish probably won't be able to help that whore. Maybe you'll finally realize she was just using you. You squeeze your eyes shut and see colorful shapes appear, dance around you, disappear. 
What's your problem? You always want to help people. But no one ever wants to help you. It's no recipro reciprocity. It's all one way. And that bitch is just like all the others. Say nothing. I don't know which he, who he means by this bitch. Probably, maybe Busse? I don't know. And I wouldn't say that she's not a whore. I'm just gonna say nothing. He ignores you. He raises his voice, not paying the least bit of attention. She treats you like shit. She's threatening you. Yeah, okay, I think she talk he talks about Busse. She's ready to drop you to avoid losing face. I don't get you. They already locked you up once. You want to go back in? I had no choice. His lather sends chills down your spine. There's something vulgar about it. Seriously, man. You had no choice? Whatever. Run, man. Take your taxi and run. My humble advice, but who am I to give advice anyway? You always have a choice, always. Not me, not then. You feel his gaze bear down on you. I don't know what you tell your passengers. Get the fuck out. He shrugs. You're a piece of shit and you know it. Making deals with traitors, sucking dick so you won't end up in jail. Man, you're the victim here. Be a victim. Use victimhood to your advantage. It doesn't happen every day. That other time, you weren't the victim. He flashes his teeth in the rear of your mirror. Killing your own brother? Now that's something. Oh, we did kill our own brother. Nice. Not. He bucks his eyes out, mocking surprise or horror. Pretty hardcore. There you go. I like it when you get angry. Show you got something in your shorts. You suddenly feel nauseous. Let me tell you what your problem is. You thought you actually had a chance in life. Your gut is burning like its contents and ready to spew all over the windshield. Like your good grades in school, your faggoty little books, as if the three months you spend in college might actually change anything. But you're nothing. According to the people of this country, you don't count. You throw up a little in your mouth, the bile stings your throat. According to the people you protect and drive all over Panam, you don't count. You double over the steering wheel, your stomach burns, but nothing comes up. You glance behind you and realize you're alone in the cab. It's just you. You wipe the sweat from your forehead and start driving again. The smell of the motor reassures you, calms you down. Well, our shadow was hel more helpful the last time we spoke to him. I was anticipating some clue or something, but no. <gasps> Ade, 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 Ade. I'm gonna go see her. She's gonna have a clue for me, right? The passenger who enters the cab is a regular. Her name is Adi, she's a psychic who occasionally goes home by a cab. She slips into the back seat, her earrings jingling softly. She smiles and gives you her address, you start the engine. You know, she's waiting for you to look up at her in the rearview mirror. I did a reading for you, for your story, and... An almost imperceptible smile flickers across her face, round one, Adi. Well, I read the Angel of Death's cards. I had this special edition, a newspaper covering all of the crimes, and the cards I drew, they somehow didn't fit. First, there was the Empress, a card that usually represents someone you're close to, probably a woman, but I got the hanged man right after it. They're opposites. The Empress represents moving forward, it's synonymous with success, and the Hanged Man, it's more like waiting, or a dead weight. It's as if the Angel of Death were compelled to kill, maybe because of the woman, of a woman? Or maybe that, maybe the she is a woman? She shrugs. This isn't really any help to you, is it? Um, everything is useful, are they? Every bit of information counts, really. She watches closely. She watches. She watches closely you. She watches you closely for a moment. Her head dipping slightly. 
When this whole business is over, will you come around for dinner with us some night? Us? Yes, us. Me and the boys. I think it's time to start over. What do you say? That's a good idea. Great. I think the kids are dying to see you. They've been asking all kinds of questions. So is Ade probably his sister-in-law? And the kids that are dying to see him, his nephews? Because I think when when we were driving the judge on this one try that we failed he said that i killed my brother for someone else like to protect someone maybe i protected ade i don't know maybe okay but i think this conversation is probably the same all of these guys we've known already let's drive the yakuza guy again at least I think that's him down there. Yes, it's Shinji. Okay, so we, drive, we drove him again and we had the whole Yakuza conversation again. He still didn't understand anything. Really? The night is over already? Oh, I didn't realize. Yep, I have met Gilda and I have met Jesus Christ. No, I haven't met Jesus Christ. I only met her. Okay, that was it. Okay, so I kind of want to know what our new clues are before I end this episode. Jonas believes we're in a simulation. Yeah, okay, I know that, but it doesn't really matter anymore. Gilda talks to Jesus. Yep, she does that. So he watches you also makes sense again now wait so if victims number one and two were kind of tied to apollonie i think victim number three must have been the the colleague of the actress that we met that's correct now the connection so maybe she was also starring in porn movies then Maybe the message on crime scene number three, Lust, makes sense too. Victim number four gave part of her fortune to defend animal cause. Oh wow, she hosted refugees in her hotel and she gave part of her fortune to defend animal cause. That was a nice person. Victims let the killer in, must look inoffensive. Which would definitely be the case for her. She looks so innocent killer connected to a woman okay I think that that my my number one suspect is Gilda at the moment because I'm also linking the, the all of the crime scene messages to her now and that the killing is someone else it now that we met her and we know that she's talking to Jesus and that Jesus tells her who's a bad person and who isn't I don't know what else Jesus could tell her in her mind. I don't know anything about victim four except for that she seems to be that she seems to be a nice person, but we don't know anything much about her. I mean the stud throat and the words written in blood and blood missing, that's yeah. It doesn't really point to any particular person, I guess. Break in for crime scenes one and three. Well I guess that's all for it for today. We did make some progress. We met Gilda and that was really creepy. Yeah, I'm gonna end the night. 
but yeah, it was a very productive day. We learned a lot. Was that really Santa Claus? Maybe, I suppose. <laughs> okay, that was really interesting. And, oh wow, it's night six already. Well, it's time for us to get the evidence. We are going to continue at another in the next episode. And then we'll probably drive someone else because I will be restarting the game then. So we will see who will be our, who our next passenger will be. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.